Kelly Animal Birchfield here, philosopher and chief of the Lawn Chair Philosophy Foundation, and I am so excited to share with you in this introductory video series the philosophy of one of my favorite philosophers, Friedrich Schiller. We will be delving into his letters on the aesthetic education of man. He finishes these letters around 1795. Uh, he started writing these letters uh, around the start of the French Revolution, around the start of the Reign of Terror. And as events unfolded, he was inspired to go back and revise these letters. I'll speak more on the influence that the political and social upheaval of the time had on his overall philosophy and on these letters in future videos. For now, in this introductory video to the introductory video series, just know that he's writing around this time. Um, Schiller is a prolific German poet. He's considered one of the German graces. He is right up there with Goethe, Jacobi, Herder, the Humboldts, the Schlegels. And don't you worry if you're unfamiliar with those figures. We'll speak more on them in later videos. For now, just know that he's held in high regard. Um, he's heavily influenced by Immanuel Kant, uh, specifically his, his critique of pure reason, and his third critique, the critique of the power of judgment. Uh, Schiller takes Kant's distinction between the pure understanding and sensibility and runs with it. He takes Kant's conception of beauty and he runs with it. Now, he will diverge from Kant's philosophy uh, in, in numerous points throughout these letters, and I'll speak more about that in later videos. Just know for now, heavily influenced by Kant. Uh, Friedrich Schiller is writing um, at the genesis, really, of the science of aesthetics, which finds its um, origin in mid-ish 18th century thought. Now, themes from aesthetics are found throughout the history of Western thought. Uh, we see that beauty plays a very important role in Plato's philosophy. Um, but the science, the philosophical science of aesthetics really finds its origin in mid-ish 18th century thought. Uh, and it's considered to be a German science, the German science. Um, it's, it's the, the, well, the scope of aesthetics really is the organic unity of the sensibility with the understanding, and it, it explores the role that the, the sensibility plays in grounding the possibility for um, the generation of higher ordered thought, uh, higher ordered belief systems, and the possibility of achieving objective knowledge in, in the first place. How it is the sensibility relates to uh, the understanding in, in generating uh, objective knowledge uh, and a whole unified person and a whole unified humanity. Um, so considering the aesthetic education of man, Schiller believes that art plays an important role and that beauty plays an important role in man's rational becoming, his maturation, uh, beauty, and art is crucial in establishing the possibility of human freedom, of self-legislation, but also the spontaneity of thought. Art, for Schiller, sanctions a space wherein we are free from the necessities of whatever social political order we might find ourselves within and frees us from the constraints of logical necessity um, in which we might find ourselves intellectually mangled and mired. Uh, and in the space that art sanctions, we can experience and express firsthand the origin of our beliefs and of our thoughts and of the becoming of our person. Um, so in order to become whole, in order to become mature, we must achieve a state 
of rational empathy and one that is perpetually becoming. And we need more than mere logical demonstrations and a, a calculating mind um, that's as precise as a machine uh, in order to achieve our full humanity and to be learned. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited to explore that philosophy and how it is Schiller specifically believes aesthetics can lend itself to the maturation of man. Uh, I wanna end this introductory video to the introductory video series on a complaint that I have uh, with the translator's introduction, uh, which in this edition was written by a one Reginald Snell. Mr. Snell writes on page 14, I have said that these letters are not a piece of professional philosophy, and it may be unfair to criticize them as such. Schiller has the faults, no less than the advantages, which are very real, of the amateur philosopher. He is wholly unwilling to use a consistent terminology and the reader must not expect it of him here or anywhere else in his philosophical writings. Reginald Schnell, Schnell, however you say your name, you can go sit on it. Let me tell you about professional philosophers, the most rational of all philosophers um, have inconsistencies in their terminology. Scholar, scholars build whole ass professional careers exploring these inconsistencies. And I would argue that these inconsistencies are efficient portals into the broader thoughts of these figures than any exegesis, exegesis of their thought taken at face value. Um, so just because Schiller is poetic in his writing does not make him any less of a professional philosopher. In fact, I think it, it, it makes him even more professional. He embodies the, the, the thought that he's trying to express. Um, if it is the case that to become whole as a human being is to unite disparate and potentially opposing aspects of the mind and of the psyche, why not express that connection through poetic language? Poetic language is ironic in, at its foundations uh, in that it, it connects disparate, opposing, conflicting perspectives. And if the aim of our aesthetic education is to unite within one person multifarious perspectives, and if the aim of an aesthetic education is to sanction the possibility of a harmonious relationship between contentious and opposing human beings, why not, why not explore this education through poetic language? Why not deliver this message through the vehicle of poetic language? It just seems efficient to me. Anyways, we here at the Lawn Chair Philosophy Foundation believe that just because you're writing your philosophy through poetry does not make you any less of a philosopher. So let us end this introductory video to the introductory video series. On that note, more on his letters, his place in the, the history of thought, and the influence of Schiller's thought on contemporary uh, aesthetic and phenomenological conversations in later videos. See you next time. Thank you.